good, everybody. I am Jamie. And I'm John. And this is the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. If you're a big Elvis fan like us, this is your society, our society, the EAP Society. Now, we are massive Elvis nerds. Yeah, one of my friends once joked that I separate my CDs into Elvis and secular. <laughs> It's actually really good. I got a lot of I got a lot of Elvis CDs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when when my wife and I uh, got married, or even before we got married, uh, people knew we were serious when we put our collections together and started selling the duplicates. <laughs> That's how people was like, "Oh wow, you guys are yeah, you're sure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah." Yeah, and that's you. how they knew we were sure. It's like, yep, we're selling these. Okay. And uh, so what we're going to do today is um, a lot of people, they see things like the complete uh, Elvis's back sessions. They see these awesome releases from FTD. We've got like Elvis Presley, the Jungle Room sessions. We've got uh, the complete His Hand in Mind session, sessions. Amazing release, by the way. And, uh, and then, you know, and like, this is not the complete sessions. Obviously we take a lot more discs than the one, but this is like a smattering of outtakes and a, a fully enjoyable release of nothing. Well, except for one raw mix master of what was officially released in Elvis's lifetime. And people think, and people may not even think because it's just kind of been like this for quite a long time. FTD was coming out with these things is starting in 1999 back when i was first doing the world record singing every song that elvis did from memory that was the year that ftd became a thing and at the time i was like wow that really they're actually going to you know yeah and, exactly and it was big news it was it was huge news and now it's blossomed and blossomed and become such a massive thing and there's a lot of people today that might think, well, you know, how did we get here? Where, you know, like, you, you think, okay, well, yeah, people wanted more, so they put out more, and they wanted more, so they put out more, and they put, you know, that's partially true. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, at the end of the day, that is that is true. But this is a story with many twists and turns. <laughs> it is, it is, and we're not going to get into we're gonna we're not going to get too too deep into it. There's actually a book that delves into a lot of stuff that's really good that I actually don't have yet. I, I would like to have that. But uh, today we're going to just kind of give you an overview of how we got from standard releases uh, to what we have today, which is just on an entire level that people back then wouldn't have even fathom yeah. that possible. How did we go from your standard album release to literally emptying out the tape vaults? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And and it comes from it comes from a few things sort of happening in tandem, happening at once. And uh, we're gonna start with the Camden releases, which we we have previously talked about. And uh, now what was special about the Camden releases? We talked about this before, but if you haven't seen the other videos, yeah, the Camden releases were basically an early attempt by RCA, starting in a, around 1968, so around around the time of the comeback. Um, they were going to take some unreleased master tapes that were sitting on the shelves um, and they were going to put them out on the budget label so mm -hmm. they could offer fans extra Elvis albums every year of stuff that they didn't have already. Mm -hmm. And these uh, proved to be so popular that they quickly uh, shot through the initial contract for three Camden releases and eventually wound up with 12 Camden releases <laughs> yeah. because Elvis fans kept buying them even mm -hmm. as they ran out of new material to put on them. Yeah, yeah. So there was such a market for that. And then, um, you know, and, and because people wanted, especially if you attended an Elvis concert, there would be a lot of fans that would uh, want to take like a tape recorder or something. Exactly. So, so you've got this happening, this starting to happen because RCA can see what's what's out there. And another outlet for Elvis obsessives that Jamie just referenced is that fans, when it was not practical, when you didn't have the ability to record on your phone, when sometimes this meant sneaking a small reel to reel tape machine in a purse in a concert, fans took it upon themselves to capture the Elvis shows they saw 
on cassette in audience mm -hmm. recording. And these are these are two of those. And these fans would not only tape these, but they had fan clubs. They had other groups of friends. They would trade shows that they had been to yeah. with other fans. So there became a really active tape trading circle mm -hmm. among Elvis fans. So you could yeah. hear what he was doing, even if you weren't at the shows. Yeah. So, yeah. So what, what they would do is they would record these and then they would go and they would say, hey, I was at such and such a show. Uh, but I missed the like I missed the next night or or oh you were at that show oh how was that oh that was really good oh can you make a copy for me oh yeah 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 and I'll make a copy for you in my show and so they would trade and that's what these that's what these are some people would like print and make it look all fancy and nice like this uh, now I will also say that um, you know there would also be uh, and this kind of ties in with the having fun with Elvis on stage as well because uh, the Colonel would also use cassettes in some cases, in a lot of cases, cassettes, and he would record from the soundboard. And that's where a lot of the soundboard tapes. Well, sometimes fans would get, would be able to talk to the right person or something like that. They might be able to get their hands on one or two of those, and those would start making the rounds. And that kind of built in, but initially it was fans like, oh, I was at this show and you were at this show. Oh, cool, cool. Do you have a friend who was at this other show? That would be really cool. And they started making copies for each other. And that's where this started. And then some people thought, wait, there might be a bunch of people that are interested in this. So then they would make records. Now, we don't have any record examples from here. but We do have, we do have this that I was given a very long time ago. And I love how, I love how they make it look like a menu. Yeah, from the season. <laughs> That's just cool. This is the longest and last, this is Elvis's last concert in Lake Tahoe and the longest concert he did there. It is over two hours. And complete he, and improvised. And he sings a lot of songs that he didn't normally sing in concert on mm -hmm. this record, I believe. Yeah, this has, uh, so obviously CC Ryder, I Get a Woman, Love Me, If You Love Me, Let Me Know, You Give Me a Mountain, All Shook Up, Teddy Bear, Don't Be Cruel, Blue Suede Shoes, Return to Sunder, which was very, That's a different one. <laughs> very rarely done, Heartbreak Hotel, Hawaiian Wedding Song, which was not very done very often then, um, America, Pokes Tell Early Morning Rain, What I Say, Johnny Be Good, Love Letters, those were standard. Uh, young and Beautiful. That's a rarity. That's a rarity. That's a right, Mama. Blue Christmas, He Does Hurt Twice. Hound Dog, Happy Birthday. My Heavenly Father, Kathy Westmoreland does. Lovey Tender, uh, Cheryl Nielsen does Danny Boy. Cheryl Nielsen also does Funny How Time Slips Away. Burning Love, Help Me, The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face. Uh, the, uh, that... Was that voice that did that? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it's been Actually, a while. no, that's Elvis, I think, on this one. I, I, I haven't listened to this. I haven't listened it's to this been tape a while. in like 15 years. Yeah, exactly. But I know that Elvis yeah. did do a couple of versions of that in time. That's so actually, yeah, yeah. You know what? I bet this is because it would have said, I would think. Yeah. Uh, Jailhouse yeah. Rock, One Night, uh, How Great Thou Art, and Can I Have Falling in Love. I mean, what a set list. Imagine, be, imagine being at that show and having a cassette and going, hey, I've got him doing. Return to Sender and, and all Young this and Beautiful live, live in 1976. And yeah. Every fan would have just freaked out. And so you have stuff like, you know, you have things like this. Well, fans would get, you know, fans would kind of maybe pool their money or whatever, and they would go to like a record place and uh, they would have. Uh, they would have a, a, a record made, and they would say, "Well, here now, you know, now it's you know it's nicer, and it's you know you can we we can do our work. It's like we're RCA or something, you know." Right. And in case you're wondering, yes, that is illegal. <laughs> yes, that is illegal, and we do not endorse. I want to stay, but the, you know, from the perspective of Elvis fans at that time, they're thinking, "Hey, I'm going to buy everything RCA puts out anyway." Exactly. I just want more Elvis. Right. Yeah. They just wanted. They just wanted more. Well, that led to. That led to more things like the Legendary Performer series. And this has, so that's right, recorded in 1954, an unreleased, newly discovered take of I Love You Because, uh, unreleased live version of Love Me, unreleased live version of Trying to Get to You, uh, Love Me Tender Peace in the Valley, Fool Such As I, Tonight's All Right for Love, which was not on the GI Blues soundtrack. Uh, oh, that would have been fodder for Camden. Anyway, um, <laughs> we could have put that on postcards from Elvis. Um, <laughs> So an unreleased live version of Are You Lonesome Tonight? I think this might be the laughing version. Um, and then uh, Can't Help Falling in Love. This is all included excerpts, uh, also included excerpts from an interview uh, September 22nd, 1958. 
RCA Records proudly present, presents the Legendary Performer Collection, a series of recordings by the world's finest musical artists. So they did others, but this has, you know, th they did a special track with Elvis. And this is, I think, the first time that RCA intentionally released alternate takes. Yes. They had accidentally released alternate takes a couple of times, mm -hmm. but this is the first time they were put out deliberately. And this was a huge seller. Oh, as a matter of fact, I think this outsold today when it came I'm out. I'm sure it yeah, did. They, they both came yeah. out in 75. Yeah, I'm sure it did. So you had things like this. Well, then fans started to get a hold of, and, and this is a crazy thought today. But back then, if you were connected enough, you could actually, I guess like a library, check out tapes from the RCA vault. And they're just like, here you go. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's, I can't even fathom that. So, uh, so you know, a couple of like rough copies got made from there. Then there were also some things that were um, discovered that were, uh, uh, there was a tape, there was a sun tape that actually escaped for yes. quite a while. It was a pretty big deal back in the day. And then you've got things like this. And this is a sealed, uh, there was an auction that had a whole bunch of stuff, and this was just in the pile. I didn't even realize. Um, and this has, now they say, my baby is gone. It's like the slow version of I'm left, you're right, she's right. gone. Um, I want you, I need you, I love you, king of the whole wide world. So there's a lot of stuff on here that are unreleased takes that, Fans, you know, were able to get a hold of them, put together, and this was, you know, I've never seen a sealed bootleg LP before. That's just crazy. Um, so then that led to even more stuff like this, such as, <laughs> such as, well, uh, oh, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're, getting there. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. And then, so you'd have this. Then fans got even more. Uh, there, the you know, certain fans got even more judicious or more. Uh, um, ambitious. Yeah, ambitious, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. And this is a complete, uh, well, one of a set of complete sessions. These were highly sought after for a very, very long oh, time. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, you know, again, gifted. I can't even imagine uh, what they would have caused it. But uh, when we don't, and again, we don't endorse, uh, you know, illegal activity, bootlegs, anything like that. These are just showing you for historical purposes. And uh, as as you saw on the bottom of the screen at the beginning of the, uh, I was going to say of the at the beginning of the hour, because very likely <laughs> this will be an hour thing. So then you started to see things like this. Wow. How they got a hold of this, I have no idea. The Blue Hawaii box. So is this everything for this Blue Hawaii? This is everything that they could get. Ah, so not quite it's everything. Not quite ever, but I mean. But it is a leap it, in completeness. It's yeah. a lot. Like over 100 alternate takes. Hawaiian Sunset, Aloha Oi, Ko'u No More, Slice and Sand, Blue Hawaii, Ito Eats, Hawaiian Wedding Song, Island of Love, Step in Our Line, Almost Always True, Moonlight Swim, Count Falling in Love, Beach Boy Blues, and Rock and Cool Baby. I mean, wow. this is just about everything. There's only a couple of things I think that are missing, and it's not much. So you've got, and it even and it has, has an illustrated booklet. Yeah, I mean, the amount of time and money that was spent, well, because they knew that a lot of fellow fans would buy these. Things. And I think, oh, hey, that looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's interesting uh, to consider this. Um, Bootleg activity, though mm -hmm. obviously illegal, is almost like a um, a market test facility for RCA. Well, and that's exactly that's they were exactly showing. The, they were showing the extent that fans would go to commercially, mm -hmm. and what kind of things they were interested in. Okay, so this is no more takes one through nine. Slice and sand fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. So Slice and Sand, there's a lot. Oh no, Slice and Sand one through fifteen is down here. Oh well. Uh, Hawaiian Sunset one through three. Aloha Oi, 1 through 6, Kuuipa, 1 through 9, Blue Hawaii, 1 through 7, Ito Eats, this is two eats, but it's Ito Eats, 1 through 9, <laughs> Hawaiian Wedding Song, 1 and 2, there's only two takes, Island of Love, 1 through 13, Stepping Out of Line, uh, Stepping Out of Line, okay, 1 through 15, oh, I'm sorry, hold on, this Slice and Sand, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, but there's oh, no step in a line. Yeah, it's step right, in a gotcha. line. So step in a line one through fifteen, step in a line sixteen to nineteen, almost always true, one to eight, moonlight swim, one to three, moonlight swim play, take four. So um uh can't help falling in love one through nine. They're missing a lot of can't help falling in love on here. 
Uh, yeah. Beach Boy Blues, one to three, and Rockahula Baby, one to five. So uh, this is coming soon, the complete Wild in the Country sessions on a deluxe Laurel double album. Beware of poor imitators. So apparently <laughs> there were a few people that were getting kind of uh, ambitious with the same thing. And so, you know, and they were just, they, the, they put out on the Laurel label kind of as a throwback idea for... Uh, a reference to Jailhouse Rock. Yep, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And... And, you know, so you see a lot of fans doing things like this. So things like this, so we're, and, and I'm just using this as an example. I'm not saying that this exactly preceded the silver box, but just to give you the idea, I'm not crushing anything. Yes, oh, yes, yes, I am a little bit. Right. Uh, sorry about that, man. No, you're good. Um, led to things like this for Elvis's 25th, and well, it's 25th anniversary of him being an RCA artist. This is the silver box, one of the most amazing box sets to uh, come out. So this came out the year I was born. Yeah, I remember growing up with this box set and loving it. Yes. Because there's so many, there's so many things that like. Oh my God. Are, oh, this is an eight track. eight track. Wow, that is a, that is an original gangsta copy of this. <laughs> right? <laughs> wow, okay. There's so many interesting things that are kind of off the beaten path on this playlist. Yeah. And. Um, See, I know you have a live show from '75. Yep. Uh, there's some rehearsal from Vegas in 1970. Yeah, this has. I I believe this has the. Um, does this have the Vegas show from '56? Yes, it does have the Vegas show yep. from '56. The first time it was ever out. Yep. And '61. It has the '61 uh, Hawaii concert. It has uh, some outtakes, including outtakes of Dayton, which are just. Gold. Hilarious. Just yeah. gold. And they were first heard on this box set. So I still can't believe this is a track. When I grabbed this, I did not realize. I thought I grabbed the LP. Yeah, uh, we've got the LP version too. Didn't realize we had the track. I didn't realize that there yeah. was this put out on the uh, Yeah. So there you go, folks. Uh, we're uh, making history. Didn't even realize it. Um, so you'd have things like this, which are fantastic. And it seems like every time the bootleggers would up their ante in terms of ambitiousness, uh, the official label is a force to do, forced to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think what you said before was apt is, you know, if you're an official, if you're the official label and, you know, there's a whole hierarchy of people you've got to pay. Oh, yeah. Somebody screws up. It's their uh, well, I'll say it's their job, right? <laughs> you know, they'll lose their butt. It's over at that point, right? Sure. All these guys are risking is jail. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> this is okay. Yeah, a little bit. So, you know, it's like the, uh, well, in the corporate world, being fired is right. where, where they probably, I mean, they almost prefer jail. Um, no, nah, that's a joke. Um, anyway, so then you started to see things like there's always me. Uh, and these box sets, and they had tons and tons of the the floodgates just kind of opened because these copies that had been circulating around from people for a while just started slipping out. Uh, there's also rumors that people were able to get things if they just kind of knew the right people. Right. Um, so that would happen as well. And then you started to see, um, you know, Ernst Jorgensen comes on the on the scene, and then the Essential Elvis series comes out. And it's amazing. It's, it's a very good series. It's it's it's, in, it's incredible, and it, it is a leap forward in um, in what RCA was doing at the time. Really takes advantage of this kind of stuff. And I will say, um, from doing research about this for this episode, it seems like the mid '90s, in terms of mm -hmm. sheer volume of Elvis bootlegs that were coming out, the mid '90s to the late '90s yeah. was the boom time. It was. Everything was coming out on bootleg. There were so many releases. Yep. Um, but go ahead, continue about well, Essential Elvis. Well, sorry. but there was an explosion of a lot more live concerts that yes. were, you know, because, you know, it was, it, as the digital technology came in, it became easier to reproduce and mass produce these things. So then there were more and more boxes that would have complete sessions on there. And RCA was very loath to put those out because obviously if you put out everything, you can't go back to that well, uh, which frustrated the crap out of fans like us because I just want the whole thing. Um, however, I will say this. 
Uh, it's probably for the best in some regard, because if they had started doing those sessions earlier, then Lene Rydell would be the one mixing those things and not Sebastian. Right. And I am very glad that we have Sebastian. Sebastian uh, put together a site called Master in Session, where he found like, okay, so there's a couple of takes from this release and a couple of takes on this and this and this. These are the best quality of these takes here and here and here. And I know I did. I'm sure you did learn so much from him. That was there. a must have resource. And yeah, like the, the um, shall we say, successors to that site are still they are. must have resources they to are. this day. Absol yes, absolutely. Yeah. Like like what Keith has been doing uh, and there Tunzi's are other sessions, books, tons of sessions, yeah. books as well. But then we got the classic albums and we were I mean, we've talked about like. Uh, it's got the masters and then it's got like what they called the essential outtakes and you know everybody's idea of essential outtakes is different now that they've gone through all of that they've basically milked the non-complete as much as they can so finally we're starting to get complete sessions and that's phenomenal and that's where you know that you see a lot of these things and that's where you know, and, and if it hadn't been for boxes like these proving that fans would buy that we never would have gotten here exactly and exactly. thank god that we're here now because what uh F ftd is able to release far surpasses the oh, bootlegs in quality the sound quality is phenomenal they're easier to get they're more cost effective they're like, legal that's they're the legal they everything are... about this is better yes yes everything about this is better so it, you know Whenever you see these sessions releases, uh, if it's complete, support it because uh, I want to see these come out faster. <laughs> and I, I mean, uh, as, as fast as, uh, as, you know, they need to pay Sebastian incredibly well. I'm just going to go ahead and say. Um, and then now, and we still have evidence of the same kind of thing today. Um, and, and, and that's what's really great about a fan market i mean i realize you know again we don't condone uh purchasing bootlegs or manufacture illegal product or anything like that um but the history has shown that it is like you said it's a great test market uh to for the the official label to look at and say oh that works well we can do that and it's also kind of the principles of capitalism and competition in the free market right if you have it's the way it should work if you have fans <laughs> putting this uh, out then obviously there's a market you can't just do the lazy thing anymore you yeah. got to up your game yeah, a yeah. Bit, because right? the expectation the bar has been risen the bar has been raised yeah. exactly. and one uh, one example that i think is really apt is like with the uh, Memphis Recording Service release of Tupelo Zone Elvis Presley. And we'll point out that the Memphis Recording Service releases are not bootlegs. No. They are legal releases mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom. They are. They have uh, different laws over there about uh, the length of copyright. So everything put out there is perfectly legal to purchase mm -hmm. and sell. And they're, they're on Amazon. Yeah, exactly. So it's not like, you know, I mean, you know, Amazon, <laughs> believe me, Amazon has a team of lawyers. They ain't screwing with anything that's going to get them in trouble. <laughs> Um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, so go Christian Smalls. That's all I'm going to say. This release that Jamie's holding is a really interesting one because this label, uh, had a thought. They thought, you know, we've all seen that little clip of Elvis at the Tupelo Fair in 1956. Uh, that's about a minute long. Yep. Wonder if the company that filmed that has any more footage. And they found out, in fact, they, they did. do. They had about 13 minutes more footage. Yeah. And so tell them what they did, Jamie. So it was uh, it was edited back together. Uh, it was in like pieces and stuff. So they edited back together and uh, they uh, took uh, audio. Uh, they had the audio from the performance that's been around forever. I think it was initially released on the Golden Box. Yes. But the cassette's been around for longer than that. And so this is... Uh, Contains recently discovered unreleased footage with Elvis performing six tracks, including Heartbreak Hotel and Don't Be Cruel, live in the afternoon show of the Mississippi Alabama Fair and Dairy Show in Tupelo, Mississippi, on the 26th of December, 1956. Never before have we seen an Elvis concert from the 50s with sound until now. And see, that's a big thing. That's a coup. That is the only existing 
sound uh, sound film record of the 1950s Elvis yeah. performance. Yeah, and it's almost an entire. It's it is almost a complete show. There are like little pieces that are missing, but not much. Unreleased, and there's also unreleased color footage of the evening performance and never before seen film of the street parade and more. There are interviews from the show, including Elvis and his parents. Also included is a rare concert footage from Tupelo 57 with Elvis performing in his Golden May jacket. Uh, this footage contains an unreleased audio interview from Elvis Presley in uh, Never Before Heard. Total running time is 33 minutes and 14 seconds. And the reason I'm showing you this, uh, one, because it's absolutely incredible, uh, seeing this was a revelation, and there's just no other way to put yeah, it. Yeah, this was a landmark release when it came out. Yeah, I, I mean, this kind of like everybody was talking about this. So this came out, and that, uh, I sincerely believe, is the reason that we got this. Yes. This is uh, two CDs. It's the afternoon and the evening show from 1972. This was officially RCA, Sony, RCA, BMG release. And a DVD, Like a Prince from Another Planet, 20-minute mini documentary featuring footage from Elvis's June 9th press conference, the June 9th evening show, and the June 10th afternoon show, plus interviews with uh, Lenny Kay, uh, the Patti Smith Group guitarist who witnessed Elvis at Madison Square Garden and wrote the liner notes for the set, James Burton, uh, Glenn Harden, Joe Gershow, uh, Jerry Schilling and and uh, the and George Kalinsky, the official Madison Square Garden photographer. Uh, the complete uh, WNBC New York film of the June 9th press conference, approximately 12 minutes. Uh, the June 10th afternoon show, complete audio with approximately 20 minutes of fan shot 8 millimeter film synced with the newly mixed audio, including a per complete performance of That's Alright. So this led, uh, I, in, in my personally, sincerely held belief, led directly to things like this. And I got one more point to make about that that shows the fan influence on this release. Yeah. Not only did the fan releases inspire this kind of approach to the material, but it is fan shot footage that they are syncing yes. with the official audience. That's a great point. Yeah. So if it hadn't have been for the fans taking their eight millimeter cameras and uh, ignoring the warning on the ticket and filming yes. the show, we which, would not have the material. Which takes us all the way back to this. Exactly. So fans from back then doing what they did led to the ability for these things to come out. And, and it is quite beautiful footage. I it is. highly recommend everyone getting the prints from another planet. Yes. Right? And and I love how that they make it look like the, the original labels from yeah. like from RCA at the time. It's it's it is it is so good. And this is what we were talking about. You know, we we've talked about before how, you know, uh, eight millimeter footage uh, is is so very important. And for people to see this, um, this is stuff that definitely should not get lost to history. Yes. And there is there's a lot of footage that's still out there that is either poorly transferred or not transferred at all. Um, this shows you what can be done when it's transferred well. Mm -hmm. It looks beautiful. Yep. Much more detail than you would expect an 8mm film to have. Yeah. And, you know, and so that's why one of the things that we want to do uh, as the EAP Society is finding more and going to collectors who have purchased and had uh, more of uh, 8mm footage and uh, building a compendium, so to speak, uh, to um, uh, of well-transferred footage, so that way it is not lost to history. So that way, more things like this could be possible, maybe even more complete than 20 minutes. If we get a few different footages that can all be synced up together, you never know. The possibilities are truly endless. I know from several friends of mine, that, especially with the evening show, there is enough footage from this performance to put together a nearly complete show. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting the angles transferred, getting the collectors who own them to agree to that. Yep. And putting all of the P's and across, uh, you know, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. Yep. Yep. And of course, you know, you paying royalties to like the, the performers and of course to Elvis's estate, uh, um, all of that kind of stuff. All of those things are, all of those things are possible. If you anyway, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, all of those things are all of those things are possible, but it, it starts with a really good a really good transfer 
of uh, of uh, as quality a, footage. As a matter of fact, uh, some bootleggers have even started doing precisely what we're suggesting. The main label yep. take up with yep. th- that release, mm-hmm. the Countdown to Midnight. I- exactly. Yeah, exactly. Actually, this is another. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, the 1976 Pittsburgh show. It's got good transfers. If it was done officially, it could be much better. Mm -hmm. But fan shot uh, footage, fan recorded audio tape, combined, preserve in audio video form almost the entire New Year's Eve 1976 show. It's it's yeah, it's it's incredibly well done. And um, you know, again, gift. Um, And I will say. We've been sent some pretty amazing stuff over the years. I know that uh, there might be there might be some trepidation about uh, about diving into this for FTD because it seems li- or Sony because yeah. it seems like the cost would be quite prohibitive. Yeah, and but, there are a lot of costs involved. We're not going to lie. Yeah, there, there are. But I think I think the Elvis market would support it, even if it was mm-hmm. a little bit more expensive. If you yep. could put together the entire Madison Square Garden show in good video and Mm -hmm. sterling audio elvis fans would buy it well and this is one of the things that you know that we've talked about i think if something like that if the costs could be gotten together uh, if the costs could be gotten together and it could be crowdfunded yeah i think the fans would support it at least at least several of these releases would be supported right and so if we can get some of this stuff together uh, we will contact the people necessary, Sony, you know, Sony, EPE, everybody involved, and uh, we will get that ball rolling. That's one of the things that we want to be able to do, and that's why we are. That's why one of the many reasons we want to grow the channel. Uh, pardon me. We want to grow the channel. We want to get uh, as many members as we can. The more members we have, the more palms we can grease to get some stuff going. And <laughs> we are in a fairly unique position. Uh, uh, both of us are individually and then together even more so to uh, be able to legally, that's a very important, legally uh, put together the, the pieces necessary to make something like this possible for a wide range of, uh, of shows so that way we can all enjoy this stuff the way we should. Absolutely. So it's not, again, so it's not lost to history. That was always the intent of the EAP Society. That is the intent now. That will be the intent going forward. And us all getting to have a lot of fun doing it. That's the whole point. That is the whole point of this. And that's why this was such a fun thing to talk about. Now, like more of these complete shows and sets of complete shows also led to something like this. Amazing. Yes. Amazing to finally have all of these. Now, I, you know, I'm a stickler. These are not mixed the way that they would have mixed back then. I would love to have this. I would love to have this set. I'd buy it again. Yeah, I'm a sucker. I'd buy this again <laughs> if it was uh, mixed in the traditional fashion, like the in-person album. Right. And the funny thing is, this is a mainline release, and it's clear, clearly targeted at obsessives like us. Oh, oh yeah. Completely. Because there, there, there is a slim and they, audience. And they nailed it. But actually, there is a sizable audience for people who will listen to basically the same set list eight times <laughs> at different nights because it's every every performance is slightly different yeah things like this wouldn't be possible if you don't think that you as a fan have an impact on what happens with official releases um i have been harping on complete sessions forever yep in 2012, I had a conversation with, I'm not saying that I'm the reason this happened, but in 2012, I had a conversation with uh, Ernst Jorgensen, who I have gotten to know, very lovely human being, and uh, uh, John Jackson, I believe his last name is Jackson. Uh, John Jackson, who is basically Ernst's boss, or was at the time, I don't know if anything has shifted. It's been a little while, it's been 10 years. <laughs> um, and at the time, I said, hey, um, I'm a crazy psycho when it comes to these things. I would love to talk to you guys about what it would cost for a crazy like me to license those things and put it out on some kind of a collector disc. Yeah. Uh, because if you guys aren't going to do it, I will do it my damn self and uh, I will find the money. I don't have it. I will find it. And uh, and he said, well, wow, you would want to do something like that? I'm like, yeah, you don't understand. I've been wanting this stuff since the 90s. <laughs> and, I, and I said, what you should do is make each one, because I said, what, what does every Elvis fan want? Well, particularly the obsessive like us. What does every obsessive Elvis fan want? 
they would like to feel like they own Elvis's RCA vault because they they would like to feel like they can just go into the Sony vault uh, of Elvis <laughs> material and just pick what they want, right? Right. So I said what they should do is they should make each each uh, each session should look like a tape box. Should look like a tape box. Now, see, I said actually like this package would be like like this size but thick and look like a tape box from the session, like completely, if there's stickers on it and written, <laughs> written and all that kind of stuff, and then you open it up and then you have all of the other boxes and the, uh, all the other boxes and notes and things like that would be postcard sized or whatever inside. So you had all of those in, in individual like postcard or maybe a booklet or something like that, and then have all of the discs like lead with like a paper sleeve or whatever, just right. sit in there like that. So that way, when you have all of them on your wall, on the on the rack, it looks like you're looking at a miniature version of RCA's vault. I, honestly, that would still be really cool. Uh, the <laughs> um, But that's what I said. I said that in 2012. And uh, I'm not saying I'm directly responsible. I'm just saying. Uh, the uh, I'm not the only person who was asking for that, by the way. I, I remember when you first uh, mentioned the tape vault idea. Yeah. It's a great idea. But I was like, hmm, man, I don't know if they'll do that. They need to put like some sort of picture of Elvis on the cover. Yeah. I think they actually came up with a great compromise. This is. This Having is, a slip case. Yeah. This is. And, and beautiful cover. Yeah. I mean, they did a gorgeous, gorgeous job. Yeah. And I like how they keep the kind of general aesthetic of the tape on the back. Like the initial releases look more like uh, tape boxes and you know, some people are like, I want a picture of Elvis, which is fine. This is cool. This is very cool. I am not gonna complain. I'm happy to have these. The sound quality is incredible. The content is incredible. Uh, um, and most important you know, for the most part, they are complete. Except for Viva Las Vegas, what the hell? Anyway, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know whose idea that was, but uh, you know, and, and bad. Anyway, uh, after Viva Las Vegas, and the Viva Las Vegas, the sound is pretty good. A little, little more reverb than I'd like, but hey, if they want to, re, if they want to re-release that, I'll buy the thing again uh, to have it complete and with a little less reverb. Because if I, if I, you know, if I wanted a bunch of reverb on this, on, uh, I would listen to the original recordings. The, the sessions should be nice and clean. Um, but these are so good, so so good, and this is because, and again, I'm not, I'm not claiming just for me, but uh, like. Fans over the years asking for this and asking for this and asking for this and proving that there is a market is what led to this being possible. Uh, I wish that I, I would love to see this for Dean Martin and stuff, too. I mean, oh, Sam yeah. Cooke. Uh, I've heard some things with Sam Cooke that, they, that have been a little more uh, outtake ish. But I, I'd love to see things with with some other artists as well. But Elvis fans, we're 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 beautifully served there are more things that i'd like to see but this is so good i remember uh when i was reading an article about the sam cook people when they were working on the 5.1 remix of the live at the copa Ooh, yeah and apparently they recorded four shows and mm -hmm. someone was asking well are we ever going to get any more shows and they're like well it's all the same set list and i'm like and <laughs> Like, uh, we bought this Elvis box. You know, I'm a Sam yeah. Cooke fan, too. I, I would buy four <laughs> Sam Cooke Copa shows. Yeah. I see your lack of vision, and I raise you one 1969 <laughs> box set. Exactly. Oh, God. Oh, that's painful. That's hurt. That, that, that hurts. Um, but, yeah, so so that's just kind of a – that's kind of a history of how fans shaped – literally shaped the market to uh, showing what they want, going for it, and doing it themselves to show that yes people will buy this here's you know and uh yeah so uh i am really happy uh and it's neat to see uh innovation that fans are still the driving force of and i will say even with these early single disc releases i remember a lot of people complaining how expensive they were because it's yeah. like 35 40 bucks sometimes compared to what bootleggers were charging in the 90s that is cheap that's one reason i don't have a lot of original bootlegs because yeah. i would see them at, set up at the conventions usually sometimes they'd be set up with in the back of their car it'd be like 50 bucks for a single disc i'm thinking 
No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. And that yeah. was in the 90s. That was in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there, were, there were. Oh, gosh, yes. Absolutely. So not only did they learn from the fans that preserved Elvis, they learned a little from Colonel Parker, too. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they did. They, yeah, exactly. Um, but it's cool because, like, you know, these are these are. Very, these are considering how many discs are on here. They're economical, um, and yeah, it's 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 really cool. So I, we've said this before. Thank you for thank you to the FTD label and to Ernst and Sebastian and Vic and Kavan and everybody and uh, everybody involved for making for 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 listening to the fans and doing these. And uh, it's never been a better time to be an Elvis fan to be true. an Elvis obsessive. It's true. Um, Support these releases, get them while you can, because yep. I don't think they're going to reprint them when they're gone. Nope, nope. The session releases are going to be one-time one time deals. After they're gone, they're gone. And also a big thank you to the fans who innovated and proved that these things are possible and the fans who continue to innovate. That's really, really cool. And, uh, and again, like I said, uh, thank you to the main label for listening. That is how fans uh, shaped... The entire market and it's pretty cool anyway we're going to deep dive into some of our uh some of our favorite things that are available if you're an intermediate fan uh just kind of getting used to things and kind of learning and you want to get a little further a little deeper into the uh, collecting world of elvis uh for his music and outtakes and live stuff and whatever we got a couple of videos that I think you guys are going to love, so stick uh, stick to it right here and uh, check out those videos. Um, like, comment, subscribe if there's something you'd like us to take a look at, and if we happen to have it, uh, we would love to take a look at it. If we don't have it, uh, you're welcome to send it. That's how I got uh, a chunk of these. Um, <laughs> the Because uh, like he said, that stuff was too expensive, so people would send things, and I'd be like, ooh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, we'd be happy to take a look at it if you want to send it our direction. Like I said, like, comment, subscribe, share this video. Uh, find us on, we're most active on Instagram and Facebook. We're also on Twitter. Um, I don't know what we're going to do on Twitter. We'll figure it out, I guess. Uh, we might have a we might have a TikTok. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we'll have to see. The uh, Watch, we're going to be more active on TikTok than we're on Twitter. It's going to be <laughs> funny. Um, but anyway, uh, so if you're an Elvis fan, uh, keep it here. And uh, if you want to support what we're doing, uh, you can watch the advertisements on the video. That does help us a little bit. Uh, like and share and comment. All, all of that helps us a whole lot. The engagement helps, helps the algorithm so more people see this. And if you really want to give us as much support as possible, you can become a member of the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. As I was saying before, like finding like different footages and things and finding legal ways to get them out to the public is uh, our bag. That is what we enjoy doing and uh, allowing for uh, collectors to uh, and, and fans to get to see things that they otherwise would not have the opportunity to. And we are working on one of the best uh, means of transferring uh, that is uh, that will be available. And that's going to be cool. We will have that in-house. Uh, and I'm excited for that. So if you want to help those endeavors, please become a member of the EAP Society. You can go to eapsociety.com, click on Become a Member. You can, there's all kinds of different uh, levels of, uh, from the inexpensive on up, and all of that helps, all of that supports. We're going to, we get enough members, we're going to be giving away FTDs. We get enough members, we've got at least one actual Elvis Presley autograph that we're going to give away. So uh, members get more, members get it early, members get extra perks, and we're just going to have a whole lot of fun together, everybody. It's going to be great. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to get to meet some of you guys if we ever get to do live events uh, yes. after all of this. But uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. And couldn't have said it any better than Jamie. Just <laughs> yeah, I've been figuring out how to uh, get this done over the week. So anyway, uh, um, yeah, uh, it's just so cool. So it's just it's such a great community. This is proof that the Elvis fan community is uh, it's uh, large and in charge. It is uh, definitely um it's definitely a, a unique and special community, and we want to see that continue. So that's just great. So I am Jamie. And I'm John. And thank you so much for checking out the EAP Society. Until next time, be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And always, DCB. My society, my society, here are those friends I want to see. Don't need no high society.
society to get me where I want to be. My society, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society.